The endoscopes find their best use when we're looking at parts of the alimentary tract or parts of the ear or the sinuses. And again, if you were to ask your mother or your father or even your aunt or your uncle about their colonoscopy, you're probably not going to remember it as a very, uh, it's almost like a visit to the dentist, but it's something that has to be done. That's performed using an endoscope. Yeah? The same principles apply. We have uh, a flexible scope. It's not a rigid scope as we use there. We have a flexible scope. You still have a light source to deliver light down it. And then you've got the collection system, which again is probably a chip at the very end of the scope that collects all the data uh, and assembles it into an image usually on a screen. In my profession, since I uh, do an awful lot of work on the stomach and the esophagus, we do endoscopy from the top. And that's usually called gastroscopy or upper endoscopy is what we use there. Um, other than that, we can use rigid and flexible scopes to look inside your ear, to look inside your sinuses, to look inside various parts of your head and neck anatomy. We can even look into joints. A lot of our orthopedic surgeons do arthroscopy. Arthro is the joint and they put very small little cameras into your joint to look around. And depending where they put instruments, they can actually take little bone chips out of there as well. So every procedure um, takes a little bit of a different laparoscope or endoscope to use it. Uh, obviously, for instance, let's start with endoscopy. Okay? If we are doing an upper endoscopy as opposed to a lower endoscopy, we have to take into account the size of the, or the length of the elementary tract we're trying to look at. With uh, upper endoscopy, obviously the length between your teeth and the lower part of your duodenum, the second part of your outside of your stomach, is much less than is the length of your colon. So it wouldn't be very nice if we were to try and take a colon scope, which is much, much longer, and do your upper endoscopy with that. We probably could be much more uncomfortable. Likewise, we have to make sure we choose the right scope for a colonoscopy. If we choose an endoscope for a colonoscopy, it's going to be woefully short, and we're going to have to interrupt the procedure halfway through to change our scope, so nobody's going to be very happy with that either, and stuff like that. Now, similarly, if we're looking inside your sinuses, we have to take an incredibly small little flexible scope, about three millimeters or so, in order to do that. So these are all specialized scopes in size rather than anything else that determine what we're going to use with them. Laparoscopically, when we're looking inside the abdomen, the scopes we use there are usually either 10 or 5 millimeters in diameter. And then if you look at the very front of them, maybe as I've shown you in class, they're either 0 degree, which means they're straight open like that, or they're 30 degree, which means they have a declination of about 30 degree downwards than what they are too. And that allows us to look around corners to an extent as well. Um, generally, we utilize um, 30 or 45 degree scopes when we're doing abdominal procedures. And I try and do most of mine through a 5 millimeter scope. It leaves a much smaller incision than with a 10 millimeter scope as well. And believe it or not, with the optics and the resolution we have from our cameras, the image you get is just as good. So I try and use that. So that's kind of an, uh, some examples of how the technology we have in scopes is very much influenced by what you're trying to do.